see where I said I wanted to start off with. Um, I think the first thing I want to just talk about very quickly, if you don't know, um, when we call stuff like, I think this comes up later in the chapters, but we can, and maybe you already know how this works too, but we can, if we say like have a ggplot, let's use like empty cars, as, uh, let's say mpg and hp, draw like g on point, that gives us like a scatter plot, right? Should g on point. My heart is kind of slow. Uh, but the thing that I want to focus on today is like the individual elements of these layers. Like what does it mean when we're doing a plus sign between layers? Um, I have no idea what this is doing. There we go. Yes, yeah, so we got a scatter plot. Um, what are these layers and like what's happening within these layers? So um, you might already, maybe some of you already know this, but G on point as like, it's a function, right? We call this function, even though like ggblock kind of delays the evaluation of the plot code until the plot is printed, we know that each layer is also like a standalone function. So like any of you like try just like running G on point and see what that returns. Um, this is like the first place that we're gonna begin. So if you just run G on point, it like prints us some like weird details. Um, to actually look at the structure of G on point, maybe something like a, you know, like a, a structure function or like as that list function might be helpful here. Um, but essentially what G on point is, is it is an instance of a layer class. Um, and I won't go into that very deeply, but essentially a layer, as you can see, is considered consisted of a type of a geom, a type of a stat, and a type of a position. Um, so I think I could actually just do as that list geom point. Um, and so geom point could be understood as like a layer, a layer in turn could be understood as like a list, like a list of a bunch of different elements. Um, and these elements could be like methods. So these are like uh, functions that are defined for the geom point layer. Um, and most importantly, they have things like stat, geom, and position. Um, and this is like the focus. I'll like loop back around to this. But the main point that I want to show here is that uh, let's actually change this to like, uh, I don't know, like sil, which is could be considered a discrete variable, make this a box plot, this draws a box plot. Um, and, the, and the way it does that, or the reason why it can't do that is because geom box plot as a layer uses the geom box plot geom and the stat box plot stat. And what makes this interesting is that you can actually do like that box plot and this returns the same thing. And then you'll realize that stat box plus geom and stat, I'll just make this plus, are essentially the same as those um, from geom box plot and geom stat. Right, so what I want to get, what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that you have like functions like geom or stat box plot. This happens often, often in other cases like stat um, function and geom function. Um, I think we talked about like stat smooth and geom smooth at some point also. Um, these tend to be kind of like aliases for what is essentially actually um, layer stat equals something like stat box plot with geom first, because that's the standard. And then like some other arguments. Uh, position. You don't have to worry about position, but they're also ggproto classes, kind of like um, geom and stat. But this gives us a layer that looks very similar to like geom box plot and like stat box plot except these also have some other nicer defaults, but these are all instances of layer. So what I mean by layer is again, just like the thing that's created by ggplot2 function called layer, creates a layer with specified geoms and stats. Um, and the way you get geom box plot is you have a layer function that specifies the geom as geom box plot, but then the user gets to supply the stat. And the reason why you have stat box plot is 
um, the stat is specified as stat box plot by default, but the user gets to specify the geom. And so what I mean by that is, actually, this is kind of hard to do with box plot, but maybe let's go back to like geom bar. If you look at geom bar and look at the stat of geom bar, it's stat count. Um, and this is, we also touched on this very briefly, but the reason why geom bar can um, take like a data frame, let's actually do that again. Um, take the iris data set, we're gonna say species do geom bar. At this point, we haven't provided ggplot with any information about how high the bar should go. We don't have a Y mapping yet, but then it will compute it for us and then give us back bar plots of counts. So this not super informative. These are even counts. There's 150 observations in iris. Uh, there's 50 observations from each species. And the way that it can do that is because geom bar by default, so formals is the function that pulls out the arguments of a function. Function is by default, geom bar has stat count. See that stat count? And it doesn't have a geom argument or Sorry. Yeah, it has a stat count and it has a default geom argument, which is why the user can't override it. Like you can't be like geom bar and like geom is actually like not a bar or something. Like that wouldn't be possible. Um, and, you know, we have so the same thing that we saw with geom box plot and stat box plot. The like stat kind of complement to geom bar is stat count. I think this also was shown in the um, statistical summaries chapter. We get the exact same output. And then if you look at the arguments of stat count, this time you have the geom that you can specify inside, but the stat is fixed. You can't supply the stat because that's stat count is essentially a layer with the default stat and you get to change the geom around that. So to make this really explicit, we can actually just up here repeat um, the default values, just to make it very clear. You can either say stat equals the character code like count, or you can also say stat count. So this returns the same thing. And just to demonstrate stat count as like the stat object can also be supplied to the stat argument. And then here, the same thing, stat count by itself is the same thing as stat count with geom that's explicitly supplied as geom bar. And that returns the same thing. Now, what makes this kind of cool um, is that, like, why would you ever want to change these default stats and geoms? Um, and that's because sometimes stats and geoms return um, uh, new data frames that you can access internally. So what do I mean by that? Well, so we have these three bars here, right? We have this Y value called count that we like didn't give. Right, like originally, like it's the it's the thing that we supply in the Y that gets mapped to you know the Y value and then show us shows up as a Y label, right? We didn't do this. So first we know that something like default is going under the hood that provides the Y value. And second, it does it in a specific way such that it counts up the values of each uh, by each discrete category in the X variable and then derives the count. Right. So that's something that's going on under the hood by both of these geom bar and stat count. Um, and just like, you know, to put it out there first, it's the stat that's doing this job, um, but we're not gonna dig into that too deeply here. What we do wanna look at is like, what is the data frame after it transforms iris, um, given the aesthetic mapping and the layer, like what is the data that's then being used to plot the actual thing? Because here's a thing that we need to make a distinction between. We need to make a distinction between the data that's like the raw data that's provided to the plot or provided to the layer. And then we also have to make a distinction between another transformed data that is used by the like quote unquote rendering system to draw things. So rendering system in this context is like, what does the grid use? So we talked about grid very briefly. I think um, we, we brought it up in the annotations chapter but think about like, what would it take for um, grid or like, what would it take for us to make these bars? We need like four corners, right? Like for instance, like we need to say like X min, X max, Y min, Y max. Um, and so we need those kinds of information as well, but this data doesn't have that. We can actually inspect an intermediate step inside the ggplot build pipeline where 
it takes the raw data and the specifications for the plot, transforms it into another data before it actually starts rendering. So we can do this with this function called layer data. This returns us the data for a given layer. So let's actually take this G on bar example, save it to like P bar. We can say, give us the data for our first layer, G on bar layer. What is the data that's being used after it takes the raw data and the plot specifications that it then sends off to the rendering system? And it looks something like this. So a couple of nice things here. One is that, you know, if you're already familiar with functional programming dplyr, this is essentially just like a couple like group by summarize and mutate calls, right? Like you're adding like columns to a data, you're collapsing and aggregating data, you have derived certain values like count um, and proportions and, you know, all that good stuff. And this is essentially um, a data frame that is faithful to what's being drawn. So this is like the intermediate step that I want to focus on. And what I mean by like exposing the, you know, functional, um, you know, functional system of ggplot, it's that there's this part of ggplot that's like super complicated and it's about drawing. And we're not going to like concern ourselves with that. But what we do want to at least have some sense of is the prior data transformation pipeline that takes us from iris and this ggplot code into something like layer data. So this is a step that we want to examine because um, just being able to manipulate the output of this can like have substantial consequences for the plot. So a lot of things that you want to do with your plot can actually be handled um, in the step between, in the data processing, like dplyr kind of step between your raw data and this kind of rendering ready data that ggplot makes. Um, and just to like formalize this a little bit, layer data function kind of looks mysterious. What you'll actually see is that the body of this function called layer data calls this function called ggplot build on the plot. So plot as in like just this like user supplied ggplot code, that's the plot. Um, just to make this a little bit clear, everything that's called a plot internally in ggplot has the class that's like ggplot. So like this is, this is the plot, it's the code specification and the data. Um, and then after you call ggplot build, you extract the like data element of that list and then you index it by like the layer that you wanna look at, the, the layers data you wanna look at. Um, and ggplot build, if you're wondering like, where does that come from then, um, is you have to look at uh, the print method that's defined for ggplot, uh, which is not exported. Um, and the reason why we look at print is if you've ever tried to render a bunch of ggplots like within a for loop, um, or like a map function, um, you sometimes get errors in printing that or like having that show up and render. Um, and that's because like ggplot, the code um, doesn't actually render the plot. ggplot is what's called a declarative system. So when you have a bunch of, like when you have like ggplot and a bunch of layers adding up, what that produces or the object that it produces, like objects that are stored here is not the plot, it's the instructions for building a plot given a data. So that to actually execute this and get back like a figure or even just like a transform data that's ready to be turned into a figure, then you have to call the print method on it. And we don't often see that because in the console, like print p bar is essentially the same as just p bar. Uh, but then in some other context, like, you know, like iterative context, like print is not called um, implicitly there. So you have to make that explicit somehow. Um, and so the reason why we're looking at plot here and why that relates to ggplot is that the print method for ggplot has a bunch of things going on um, that are not super important, but the two important parts are right here. Um, so it takes x, which is the ggplot object, which is again, like your familiar user supplied code. Um, it does some stuff before. And then the crucial step is it takes the data from the plot or it, it derives the data for um, turning it into like a G table as like the graphical representation of the plot. The graphical representation of the plot takes a data, um, which is essentially uh, the transform data that you saw here, right? So this is, this calls inside print. The most important step is this function called ggplot build. ggplot build gives, gives you a bunch of data that's ready to be rendered. And then as we saw, layer data is essentially, you know, ggplot build and then a data for a particular layer. 
yeah, hope that's kind of clear. Um, and the reason why I keep emphasizing like data ready to be prepared is because in here, in layer data, we have things like Y min, Y max, X min, and X max, which are parameters that the primitive graph, the primitive graphical object called the rectangle uses because it needs four corners to be drawn. Um, there's also things like color, fill, and size, and line type, and alpha, uh, which kind of come for free and default, but like it doesn't get used. But in any case, like ggplot internally calculates these variables so that the plot is ready to be drawn. Um, and so this is, for us, when we think about ggplot as like a functional system, um, we could say iris and the plot code is the input, this is the output. And that, of course, makes a lot of simplifying assumptions, but when you're talking about ggplot internals, you kind of have to make a lot of simplifying assumptions. Um, so to go back to the question of how did they get, how did ggplot like geombar, or as I kind of gave you the answer already, how does stat count um, calculate these variables and how does it, how is it able to eventually access them? Um, the first question is a little bit harder and maybe I'll get to that if I have time, I think I might. Um, but the question of how does it access variables like count? Um, how does it know to map this count variable, which does not exist in Iris, but it does exist somewhere along the, this data transformation pipeline. Um, how do we have the Y value for this be the same as this internal count variable? Um, and what you'll notice is if you grab um, stat count and you look at this thing, uh, this uh, property of the stat count object called default aesthetics, you actually see this thing called after stat count. So does that like intuitively, um, this is what you might be thinking. This function basically grabs the variable count that was calculated by the stat. So it's like in plain English, it's saying, wait until the stat has intervened and transformed the data to you know, derive values like count and prop. And then at that stage, grab this count column and then map it to X or Y. Um, and you know, by default, it does it to both because you could like have the bars flipped and it's only when you override it with like X or Y that you uses the other variable to use the after set. Um, but just to make it extra clear, um, this means that you can like do this. So I'm gonna keep adding on to this to show you all the uh, defaults that are implicit. Um, y equals after stat. Out works exactly the same. Um, and this, you know, opens you up to what, whatever other things that you might expect to work inside aesthetics. Like um, once you have grabbed after, or once you're in this after stat context um, and have grabbed count, it's like, it's just a column. It's a, it's a vector. It's a numeric vector. Um, so you can do like count plus one. And then now the bar is a little bit higher than 50. And then we can also check with like layer data. Um, the default is it looks at the first layer and that's the only layer. So now Y is 51, count is still 50. We didn't change the value of count. We just grabbed that column and then added it to one. Um, and this, this was like, a, this was kind of a newer development. So I think actually the ggplot book um, used, did they use stat or like dot dot, which like, some of you may be familiar with, there's this um, notation like stat bar or um, dot dot far um, as like a way of accessing the internal variables. You might've seen that. Um, ggplot as a version 3.3.5, uh, which was came out like end of last year, um, started uh, transitioning to, or like started formalizing this notation uh, with a bunch of like after blank functions, like after stat and after scale. Um, and whatnot. So this is how that gets that's getting reflected in the default aesthetic for stat count here. Yeah. So I think let me see what else I prepared for that. Any questions so far, or like should I should I go over some other things? I know that was kind of a lot. Oh wow, there's an analogy coming up here. Ryan, do you want to? <laughs> Explain the analogy. I have no idea how cars work. <laughs> no, it's okay. So no, you. I mean, you're 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 buying a Mustang, right, or a or a Camaro, or some kind of hot rod. 
And, uh, you know, they have different classes, different options, different uh, engine types, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I want to, I want to tune this engine. I want a hot rod. I want something that's like crazy powerful. Right. So I'm going to find the best option, but yet I'm not going to take what the engineers have designed the car to do. I'm going to add my own engineering to it. So therefore I have to open the hood. I need to change components. I need to, you know, make the, make the computer run a little bit different, et cetera. What I'm, what I'm, seeing happening and this is awesome that you're you're adding this to our our discussion is the fact that you're you're opening the hood to gg plot and actually seeing the underpinnings of exactly what's going on now I, the only comment i would make to this uh, discussion and it's probably just me um a lot of the functions not functions a lot of the uh syntax that you're typing i've never used before or i'm not familiar with it um so it is uh, uh, slightly overwhelming to to see uh, access points that I didn't realize were there, um, as in like arguments and whatnot. Yeah, okay. well, I mean, I, I'm I'm kind of thinking like you know the, the only thing I ever deal with is whatever the environmental variable uh, populates with or the object mm -hmm. populates with. I don't know anything else that's going on underneath. Um, I think Kent and I, uh, or, or maybe you had even uh, commented uh, when we were talking about the mapping uh, function. And I said, I don't really know exactly what's going on underneath the, the layer here, but this is what the output is doing. Um, I think, Kent, you had stated something to that fact of, of different uh, libraries or different uh, oh, engines, I think we were calling them, uh, different, different layers, uh, production uh, outputs of, of what you're doing with your data in a mapping function. I don't know. I mean, it, it could be a bad analogy. I apologize. Um, I'm thinking of like tuning here, uh, making making a hot rod out of out of what we're doing. I think I I think that that does like encapsulate a lot of it. The ability for you to like they have optimized it for something, but then you can use it for something else, which is exactly kind of what we're doing here. Um, if you want to see like a practical example of it, um, you could do something like after stat count over like sum count, um, which like. This kind of makes you thinking about count as like, oh, it's another column, it's another vector. We can like do like aggregating operations on it. So what this would say is um, for each species, for each species mapped to the X aesthetic, um, the Y value is gonna be the derived count values of each species divided by the sum of all species, which actually gives you just like proportions. So now it's like 0.33. And like, that's like a thing that you can do, like on the fly, calculate um, derived values based on what's being calculated internally. Question. So when you're talking about ggplot build and ggplot g table, mm -hmm. so ggplot build, I ran that and I get that that creates a list with a component. One element is data, one element is layout, and one element is plot. So that that makes sense, and then you can access those different elements as you need to. Um, what about G table? I tried to get an output for um, G plot, uh, GG plot underscore G table, mm -hmm. and then I passed the plot over to that, but got an error. So I was curious what what's the output on uh, for so the G table? G table takes uh, doesn't it take G plot G table should take. Ggplot build. Oh, it takes you a ggplot build. Okay. Yeah. So then it'll give you. So g table is like a is like a grob table. So it's a it's a list of grobs that are arranged in a table. Um, oh, which is yeah. if you're thinking about like uh, you know um, graphical elements, this is actually not the like most like the best way or like at least not like the standard way of storing uh, grobs. But it's here because it helps make ggplot. So g table is actually a package um, that it's like a package that's called internally by, or like used internally by ggplot um, and like pretty much only ggplot. Um, but essentially like kind of keeps track of what's in there, um, in the plot, like the graphical objects that are in the plot. And like you usually oftentimes won't be like debugging in, you know, here. Um, if you've seen a lot of code or if you've seen a lot of those like stack overflow answers on like, how do I do X in ggplot? And it's like a very like small, like tweaks in um, the graphical output then you'll see uh, some people like digging into like the G table output and then like subsetting it and then like assigning things into it or like grabbing it like you know so like that kind of a thing is like very complicated and I don't want to touch that um, which is why we're kind of focusing on like the build part 
because like this is our familiar data frame and oftentimes this is sufficient for us to do the things that we want to do. Uh, but yeah, this is what gtable output looks like. It takes the output of ggplot build and then returns you graphical elements like the the x the, the y axis on the left and like the the title and you know like the and the and then the the grobs which are the actual things that are being drawn that are associated with these elements like rectangles and empty spaces and more complicated grob trees and stuff like that. I had passed in the plot itself, so I had G table, then the plot name instead of GG plot build, and then the plot name. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's cool. Yes, yeah. and this is kind of nice that I get to just like live code this, and this is recorded because one thing that I feel like is really lacking in discussions of GG plot is just like knowing how to like debug it, or at least like trace the steps of like you know like what does it do when and all that stuff. So actually, in the GG plot book um we might we're gonna see this like way in like chapter 20 something whatever uh, but it starts talking about like there's a step where ggplot does this and there's this other step where ggplot does that but like the steps are not like referenced like in the code um so it's kind of hard to like go back into the source code and check like what is the actual line that does this um but one thing that i'll show you here that's really convenient for um debugging ggplot is like a debug function um, or like a debug once function. What this does is essentially attaches a browser call once you enter a function. Um, and so if you do debug once on like, um, here's, a, here's a function that I like to use, like a default base function that I like to use for these demonstrations. Um, this function called replace is like a really simple function. It takes like a vector, uh, a list of positions where you want to replace the values and then the actual new values that you want to replace the old values with and the code is like super simple. Like this is, you know, it like it, it replaces values of the steps that you want it to replace it um, with the values that you want to replace it with. So if you call uh, this function called debug once on a function, like without calling it, it's just like the function um, it doesn't do anything. But this is now um, being debugged. So once you enter into that function, you're able to see the internals of it. So if we do like replace one to a vector from one to five. Um, at step three, I actually want to replace it with like the value 100. Enters into a debugging environment. Now you're at this context. You have access to, um, you know, the arguments that were passed in like X list and values. Um, you're currently at like this step. So you're not doing anything here. You can do, you can um, press or you can enter N, uh, which is gets you to the next step. So now you're at this step um, where you're assigning values to X list. You can inspect what X list looks like. It's the value three inside X. And then the new value is 100. You run this step, whoops. And then now X, the value of X is changed to one, two, 100, four, five. And then if you press N again, then it will, you know, that's the end of the function. So it returns that value and you get that back. Um, alternatively, if you want to exit early, you can call C. Um, we're at the last plat step. So those both do the same. Um, so I'll just go with N here, exits, and then it gives you back these values which, um, you know, doesn't change like the actual like code for replace. Like it was just like you added a debugger in there. So if you run this again, um, it doesn't get you inside the debugger. Um, and then there's nothing weird going on with this behavior. So uh, this is what we can do with like ggplot build. So uh, ggplot build again is like the thing that takes you from like the, the, the code um, which includes like the data plus the plot specifications, which are built up with like ggplot plus like geom and stat and cord and all that stuff. Um, and then gets you to like, you know, layer data among other things, but layer data is often the thing that we're most interested in. So debug once, get us into ggplot build. ggplot build is actually not actually a, a thing called a, a generic. So you'll see that the body of ggplot build is just called use method ggplot build. So if you try to step into it, it's just a single line and you can't really look into that. Um, and this is the same case as like print, like use method print. So you have like a ggplot build to actually access the code for ggplot build. Um, you have to grab the ggplot build function as defined for the ggplot class. And this is like the syntax for it. Don't worry about it too much. Um, but this is unexported. Um, and again, if you just do ggplot build, colon, 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 ggplot build, dot ggplot, this will take you to the internals of the build pipeline. And this is 
this inside this is everything that needs to happen to take you from a layer's data. So in this case, iris, but like to make it make it explicit again, data is iris. It inherits from the like here, right? Like if you don't specify layers for yourself, or if this is your first time seeing it, this is what it does. Um, the, you can specify an explicit data argument to a layer um, that overrides um, like the the data that's passed into the ggplot function. Um, but this is just to make it explicit. So our layer starts out with this data, um, and then we're going to get back something that looks like this. And that's what's going to happen inside ggplot fill. So I'm going to step into this function, and we're going to explore this together. So we have placed the debugger inside. Um, the way we call it is to print the plot in the console. You don't have to explicitly call print, but you can. And this will trigger the print method for ggplot, which again, you can access with ggplot2 colon 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 print dot ggplot. Yeah. Okay. So now we're inside. Um, we're inside and we start out with our plot. Our plot again is the thing that we save to keybar. And this is class ggplot, the plot variable that we get um, from calling print uh, or calling uh, inside print when it does ggplot build x. Um, plot is essentially the same thing as pbar in this case. I wonder if identical works here. Yeah, same thing. Um, so then we get in here. Uh, we make a clone of the plot. It's, thankfully, it's very intuitive, but I, if you haven't seen this function, it makes a clone of the plot. Uh, makes a clone of the plot. Uh, and now this part is just checking if you passed it any layers. So if you ever did like just ggplot and then like printed this to the console, it just gives you a blank with like the default theme. Um, that's because it actually has this geom blank layer. Um, and we need we need like at least one layer so that like the rest of the build code doesn't collapse. Um, so we do that. Um, that's not the case here, so it doesn't do anything. Um, and then at this point, we are starting to prepare for the manipulations of the data. So if you recall, a plot can have many layers um, and also include information about some other things like coordinates and scales um, are actually not counted as layers, but layers are the things that we created with ggplot2 layer function, right, which take like geoms and stats. Um, coordinates and scales aren't those. So you're going to leave those information elsewhere, but then you're going to pluck out all the layers. In this case, our plot just has one layer. So plot underscore layers is essentially just a list. Um, and each index is like the index of the layer. And this is the same thing that we saw with like if we just did geom bar, right? So our first layer is geom bar and we didn't really give it any, or we did give it like an Y aesthetic. So that's reflected here. Uh, but this is the case because we have um, one layer. If it was like, if we had like a geom bar and we also had like a geom point, then plot underscore layers will return us two list um, with like two layers. Uh, and this is how, again, just this, just this is just how layer objects are printed. Like even though this spans multiple lines, this is a single single object here. Um, so then we pluck out layers. So layers now looks like a list, single element. This is a geom bar layer uh, with the after stat aesthetic. Um, and then layer data um, essentially loops over all of these layers and then plucks out the data. Um, in this case, the data, the starting out data for um, our first layer is uh, called waiver, and that's because it's being inherited. Um, but like, I think at some point this actually gets translated back to iris. There we go. Yeah. Oh, or it called layer data on it. Okay, so, um, but yeah, the, we, we start out, so we, we grab the layers. The, this is like all the specifications, like the code base specifications for how the layer should be built. And then we grab the data. And then now what we're going to do is we're going to, for each layer, we're going to pair up the data with the, oh, this is really odd, pair up the data with the specifications for drawing that layer to get us back the transform data that we saw with our layer data function. 
And this is essentially um, the bulk of what ggplot build does. Um, it also picks out scales. I'm going to skip over all the parts where it deals with scales. But essentially, um, uh, at some point, at some points, multiple points, um, it goes back and forth between transforming the data and then creating like a layout. So layout involving things like you know facets and things like that, because those can affect how the data gets split up. Um, and so they like reference each other, but the layout part is a bit more complex. So we're just going to focus on the data. Um, so at this step, we pull out the scales and um, this just contains information about the scales. So like we have a discrete X, a continuous Y and all that stuff, but we're not going to worry about this for now. Uh, this next step uh, creates this internal helper function called by layer. Um, and again, this is, um, you know, kind of named intuitively. What it does is by layer takes a function that takes, that loops over every layer and data, and it just applies that function to each layer and data. Um, and so uh, there's a next, there's an example of this coming up. So I will uh, not dig into this too deep for now. Um, at this point, we also make another copy of layer data into this data function. Um, that's just, I think that's just to keep track of things. Um, here's what, where things get interesting. So all of these parts that uh, follow this like first assignment to data keeps doing things to the data and then assigning it back in. So this is kind of our similar like dplyr or pipeline, right? Like this is what dplyr would look like if you didn't have the pipes. Um, you take data, you do something to it, you assign it back to itself, and then you just like keep repeating that process. Um, and then you get back the final like final output, at least in the functional sense, the final output um, for the plot, the data for the plot. Um, so this is essentially could be thought of as just a bunch of dplyr calls. Um, this step, or just like terminological note. So again, by layer is a function that takes a function. It's a function that takes a function as an argument. And this, this function that it takes as an argument is uh, does something for each layer and data pair. So what this is saying is it you you really only need to read this part to understand it. It's like for each layer, get the setup layer method of that data or of that layer, um, and then call that method with the data of that layer and then like the rest of the plot specifications, for instance. And this is how most of most of them work out. Um, the setup layer function for a layer is like this. You can't access this from here because it's a function, but we can actually just go back to our layers. And then, you know, like this is this is just like the classic, like how do I how do I debug like a like, like a functional? Like we, we're just gonna pull out the first element and apply that function to it. So we have our first layer, layers, as I showed very briefly uh, not list. Names. Um, have like a bunch of these components to it. Some of them are functions and some of them are like other objects, but these things like compute and map and like, you know, set up and finish. Uh, these are like functions that are defined for a layer. Um, and so what is the function set up layer defined for our layer? Uh, geom bar. So we just take our layer and then we look at the setup layer function of it. And it looks kind of complicated, but like if you're really interested, you could again put like a debugger in here, um, except you would have to use ggtrace for that um, because it's kind of hard to access. That's essentially what the package does, by the way. I'm not really demoing it here, but you can enter into a debugging environment in like these hard to reach places, like unexported objects and um, methods of a reference class and stuff like that. Um, but this is, so essentially you have um, for this line, just like sets up the data. Um, and I'm not gonna go over this very much in detail, but what we can do is just like, we can take snapshots of data. So let's say data before is data. And then we're gonna run this setup layer or yeah, this uh, setup layer line. Now we're at here. So because we just ran this line, we look at the new data and I think it kind of just looks the same. I think we don't, we're not really doing much in that step. 
Um, and of course you can dig into it if you really want to, because this is just data frames. Okay, and then you're doing some things with the layout. Again, we're not gonna touch layout um, because layout is like very complicated. Yeah, you don't wanna touch that for now. Um, and then the next step is you, after creating this layout object, use the layout to set up the data. Um, and again, we're gonna do another assignment to data before. It's the current state of the data. Oops. We're gonna run this line, look at our data. Um, at this step, we kind of have this new column, as you can see here, it's a bunch of ones, it's called a panel. Um, and this is, um, if you look back in layer data uh, output, you'll also get like this panel column. Um, and if you did like a facet wrap, that's where it starts assigning panels. So if we had like facet wrap by species, for instance, such that you only get one uh, species for each facet, then the values of facet will be split between one and two and three. In this case, we don't have a facet or like we only have one facet. Um, and so we just have one column for facet whose values are all one. So we can roughly say, you know, this is entirely exploratory. I'm, I'm not like going into what these functions are doing, but I'm just comparing the before and after. And I'm just being like, okay, so this step has split up the data by panel or like has at least added in the information such that we can split up the data by panel at a later step. Um, and what about this step, compute aesthetic step? We're again, make assignment to the data at this step, snapshot it, run this line, look at the new data. And then we get back another column and this compute aesthetics column seems to be adding this new um, aesthetic or new column called group. And I think at this point, we also lose access to uh, columns that we haven't mapped to any aesthetics. Right, so we had like all these like sepal length width and pedal length and pedal width. Um, after we do this compute aesthetic step, those get dropped and only the aesthetics that we actually specified for the layers are kept, in which case it's just one. It's just the species mapped to X, right? And then it's been appropriately renamed to X. We have our panel, new panel variable from before. And now we have a new group variable, which represents the IDs of each bar. So here we have Satosa as group one, Versicolor as group two, and then like Virginica as for step or group three, um, right? And I'm, I'm purely just describing things here because I think you should explore these on your own if you would like, and like GG Trace will help you with that, uh, but that's kind of like too deep. Okay, uh, how about this next step? Uh, we get the data and then we transform them with the scales. So I think this is, is this a step where like, categorical things get mapped to numeric values. Let's see, data before is this current data. We run this slide, look at the new data. Um, oh, I guess I didn't do anything for now. I think this is this step transforms the continuous variables if you have like um, like log scales or something, uh, but I might have to check. Uh, some more scale things that we're gonna uh, gloss over. So like you, you grab the X scale and the Y scale and you uh, make the scales depending on the limits of the data, which is essentially what these three scales are doing or these three lines are doing. Um, now we're at this map position function. Um, I data before is the snapshot of data that we have now. Call n, oh, whoops, uh, data. Oh, <laughs> I skipped this part. Uh, I accidentally ran two at once, but this part actually doesn't do anything. This is map position um, is what happens if you have like stacked bar plus, for instance. Um, and then you would like kind of stack the bars up together um, according to groups. But we actually gloss over the important part, which is the compute statistics. Uh, this is the part where the stat, uh, the stat ggproto jumps in. Uh, and so we have this, this data from the stat that looks very similar to um, our layer data, because in, at least for the data transformation pipeline, the stat is doing the bulk of the work. And so the stat takes, you know, some uh, stat takes the, the data um, and then like some things about the layout and then it like spits back out these things. Um, and of course, like I've kind of just glossed it over as like a single step, but a lot of different things go into it. Um, and so I will maybe add a link on like going deeper into like ggproto methods because what's actually happening here is the layer compute statistic method 
let me actually, ggbody is a function from ggtrace that allows me to look at it in terms of like a list, like the steps. Um, what it actually does, it, it calls like, it calls the compute layer method of the stat. And then the compute layer method of the stat calls like the compute panel method and then the compute group method. So, which is essentially just to say that there's a lot of stuff going on internally that we're glossing over as a single step. But at least for the purposes of locating what happened to where, ggplot build is a good place to start. And then you can start digging into like, okay, I wanna like put a debugger here, for instance, and it will be kind of the similar process. Um, yeah, and then I'm gonna, so this is like the part where I, where I wanted to like get to just to show you that like internally it does these things and you can inspect it and then you can also change them. Um, I think also once you're inside the debugger, you should actually be able to um, just like make modifications to it for fun. So data index one pulls out this thing. Um, if we like, for whatever reason, wanted to uh, change the value of count to like 45, and then we're at the point where we're at the point where I wanted to stop. So I'm just going to press C that will get us running the rest of the steps and get us out of here. Um, and I think this should have consequences for the actual plot. So now, now it's not up to 50 anymore, it's up to 45. Do you see that? It's like kind of small, but yeah. Okay, let me look back at chat. I saw some things going on. Um, yes, how much of the trickery can be learned from advanced R? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And a lot of these, I actually, so, so a lot of um, going into building the ggtrace package, which kind of details these a little bit more in detail um, but does, but there's no like video for it, which is kind of, um, yeah, kind of sad when it comes to debugging because debugging should be interactive. But um, advanced R helped me write the package. It didn't really help me like learn debugging. <laughs> um, I think advanced R is a bit shallow on um, going over debugging things. Um, but I think once you have the tool, it's easy for you to go exploring. Um, and I think the maybe the only concept that you really need from advanced R for helping you understand ggplot internals a bit better is just like there's a there's a chapter on functionals um, that goes over things like map and loop and like l apply and things like that um, because ggplot is has a lot of base r code in it um, and does a lot of like doing things by layer like looping over layers and you know like mapping over like scales and all that stuff um, it might be useful to go back to that chapter on functionals just so that you can read the internal code um and then yes i'm gonna and also like i i like did all of this and like made the gg trace package um during the semester and so like i haven't had a lot of time to go back to it and like you know do more stuff with the documentation um and like showcases but um i will be doing that um over over my winter break as well so um if you just watch out for that i will try to create something that's more like geared towards like people who are simultaneously learning ggplot and then also learning, wanting to learn ggplot internals. Uh, yes, uh, different stat options, identity count. Yeah, this was something that I, I was like considering focusing on and then I, I know I said I would and then <laughs> I did not, but yes, what do they use and when to use them? Um, so when is kind of a, Oh, let me actually just do that really quickly now, since I do have a couple minutes. So this is this is this was the ggplot debugging things, exposing functionals, whatever. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about the thing I promised I'll talk about, which is like stat options. Um, so we talked about how stat count and geom count, count are, uh, the or geom bar are doing kind of the same thing. When would you use one over the other? Um, it depends on whether you are you want to draw a bunch of things using the same or I'll actually just demonstrate it first. We have Iris here, or let's actually, actually use something else. Let's use like the penguins. Um, if you don't know this package, it's, it's just a data package it comes with uh, you know, this penguins data set, which includes penguins, uh, data set on data about penguins. Uh, penguins, let's do like species, um, and, like body mass. Oh, well, actually we're showcasing bar here. Uh, we don't need the Y. Uh, we can do G on bar, which gets us here. Uh, we can also do like stat count, which does the same thing. Um, imagine if you wanted to do like 
if you have a plot where you want to show or where you want to show a bunch of different properties that relate to the count of different species. Um, and so if you're kind of overarching question, overarching research question is about the counts of things, then it might be kind of nice for that to be represented as this, right? Like something like that, instead of like, you know, say you wanna have like a bar and like have a text of the number of counts above them, um, like geom bar, geom text. Let's actually write out the full code. Um, so we have stat count here. The, to make it explicit, y equals after stat count. And then the geom is by default geom bar. Um, and this gets us bars whose heights go up to this y variable, which is just the count variable after the stat has been applied. You can do the same thing, grab the same y value, but then make this geom like geom text. And then maybe we want the labels to be the species uh, label. And then like that works, <laughs> uh, which is kind of nice. Um, and so like, if you have a bunch of these, you know, like things where they're, the, the, they're motivated by the same idea of wanting to visualize counts, then you can just have multiple count calls, make that explicit, make the, the, the data part explicit, and then the geoms can vary, right? And then if you were trying to do it here, it will be focusing more on what's being visualized, right? Like what the, the aesthetic components that are being visualized. And so you would do the, the same thing, um, stat equals stat count. And then, yeah. So to answer your question, which doesn't really answer your question, but that is like the, the answer is like, which one of these codes do you like better? <laughs> That's essentially what it boils down to. Um, and, you know, if you read the, um, right after ggplot 2.0 or sometime after ggplot 2.0 was released um, back at the end of 2015, uh, Hadley uh, says something to the effect of like, I made a design mistake. I should have called these layer functions instead of having stat and geoms. Um, <laughs> so this actually should have just been called like, layer like you you know layer count or layer bar and we should have just been able to we should have just been like you have to specify both um and then the the reason is like this is actually very convenient because like this makes the code a little bit more readable and functions are a little bit more readable um uh, but what ended up happening is that people expected geoms and stats complements uh for everything so for example for a while um there was no geom function there was only stat function and stat function is actually more versatile than geom function because in like statistics, like when you're drawing functions, it's not always a line. Like it's not algebra anymore. Like you can draw like, you know, cumulative distribution functions, which require like an area um, or like a function could be like, you know, like an ellipse. Um, and so it could be like a polygon. Um, and like, so stat, stat function, that layer was motivated by the fact that like people would keep the stat constant and then like, they would want access to like different geoms to you know draw the stat, draw like the function, um, and then people are like, why isn't there a geom function? And so they added it like a way later. But then like you know that's not like desirable because people have expectations for things that you didn't want to set up expectations for. Uh, so Hadley was like, this was a mistake. Um, but like so far as practicality goes, yeah, no difference between the two. It's just like which code do you like better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess like for me, I like this one better, <laughs> but you could also like this one better. Um, cause yeah, cause I think stat, stat is the part where like after, like stat is the thing that makes it clear what kind of variables are available in the after stat. Um, and so like, if you did like geom text and after stat, it kind of gets weird until you're like, oh, you use the stat count. But then like, it's kind of explicit that when you do a stat count, you're gonna do something with you know, the count variable after the stat has been applied. Otherwise, why do you use the stat? So I kind of like this approach better, at least when I'm doing like multiple stat count calls, as opposed to multiple geom layers with stat count transformations. Yeah, hope that's clear. Got it, cool, thank you.
Um, let me just mention here, uh, Priyanka hit me up on the, just on a direct message and, and asked, uh, just asked me uh, to close it out. Um, we're, I know we're at the time right now. So if there's, I don't know if anybody has any last questions or um, if not, then I think we can uh, maybe wrap up. Um, I think that sounds good. And uh, thank you to June. And I think thanks to everybody else for your comments and insights. And other than that, we can, we can catch up on the Slack. Sound all right? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks all. Cool. Thanks, June. Thanks a lot, everybody. See ya.